about the last conversation you had. Was it a mutual exchange of ideas or more of a monologue? I think every conversation holds the potential to be one where both people are thinking together instead of just one person doing their thinking. If you've ever felt the need for a fresh perspective on teaching, learning, or personal growth, this episode is for you. First, we explore the power of coaching. So coaching is fueled by listening and questioning. That stands at the heart of it. We also talk about teacher humility in the classroom. Well, I think uh, teaching is incredibly complex. To me, the only truly honest response to that complexity is humility. And finally, the emotional pull of goals in education. The motivation comes from a discrepancy between where I, where I am and where I want to be. Welcome to the School Leaders Project, a podcast series dedicated to helping school leaders make positive changes in their schools and communities. In every episode, we talk to extraordinary thinkers and doers about their experiences and experiments with teaching and learning. The School Leaders Project is an initiative by TOTL, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. TOTL offers a truly comprehensive experience, so all that big picture unit planning you're doing flows seamlessly into day-to-day -day instruction, assessment, reporting, and even parent communications. We started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as cool as teaching teams, and we're now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. Let's dive into this episode with Jim Knight. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks so much for being on the show. Can't wait. I'm excited. So me too. I'd love for you to start by just sharing with our audience, who are you and what is the work you do that you're most passionate about? I'm Jim Knight, and I don't know if there's anything I'm most passionate about, but I'm really passionate about our, our overriding goal of all the work we do is excellent instruction every day in every class for every student everywhere. And everywhere is Tanzania and Toronto and every child is every child. So, um, we're relentlessly pursuing that goal at our little company called the Instructional Coaching Group. And uh, I'm probably best known for work we've done on instructional coaching and uh, been studying that since about 1996, I think. So a long time. Wow. So I think for a lot of our audience, coaching might be kind of a newer term still. So how do you differentiate a leader who identifies as a coach versus a more traditional leader? Well, uh, so we stumbled onto this whole approach called instructional coaching. Initially, we called it, uh, I think it was uh, a learning consultant, and then we shifted to an instructional collaborator, and then we shifted to instructional coach. But it was a role that a person holds, um, like a curriculum coordinator or uh, assistant principal, but a coach is a teacher who works with teachers. And... Um, there's lots of definitions. People see it. I mean, there's all kinds of coaches. You can get a coach on probably there's probably there's a chat GPT coach. Now you can get a coach for whatever you want, you know, um, dating coaches. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there's all kinds, but I would say what distinguishes a coaching conversation from a more directive conversation is that you interact in a way that is helping the person think more clearly about what they're doing not so much giving them advice, but really asking questions that helps them get clear on what they're doing. And instructional coaching, what we do in instructional coaching is um, a person who has a lot of expertise, but they don't act like an expert. They share that expertise in ways where the other person is still the one making the decision, making the choices. So coaching is fueled by listening and questioning. That stands at the heart of it. That was going to be my next question. So it's majority, if I'm coaching, I'm mostly just asking provocative questions. Yes, but if it was instructional coaching, you would also share ideas. So let's say, for example, you were my coach. You might say to me, is it okay with you if I share a few thoughts about different strategies you could use to hit your goal? And you wouldn't do that unless you said it sounds like he doesn't know what to do and he's struggling. And so then you would share those ideas, but you don't, you don't say, you know what I think you should do? This is what I did when I taught fifth grade. You don't do that. You say, Here, let me share some ideas. You tell me which one of these gives you the most confidence. And then, and then, then you check and say, "Now are you sure?" Because we could look at do, you know, we could look for other things as well. But the whole way through, at least, is how we do it. What we call more dialogical coaching. The whole way through, the teacher is the one making the decisions. I just provide options, but I also ask a lot of questions and do a lot of listening. So it sounds more like a partnership. That's our core metaphor. We talk about 
we talk about the partnership principles and the partnership approach. Partner, in, in other words, we would say when people are talking in a coaching conversation, it should feel the way it feels when two teachers are talking about uh, instruction. It's not one up here and one down here. It's two people working together. Which I think must be, have you found that there's some resistance from some leaders to let go of almost that hierarchical style of conversation? Or is it a pretty natural fit that uh, leaders gravitate towards? I think everybody has a hard time not giving advice. Yeah. So if uh, someone came to me and they were uh, saying, you know, I have this problem and I had the solution in my mind, I know exactly what their solution is. It's very hard not to give it. But the trouble is I don't know their whole story. I don't know all their experiences. I mean, imagine if somebody came to me and there were issues in their marriage and they said, what do you think I should do? And I don't know their partner and I've never been together with them and I've only, or I've maybe spent an hour with them, you know, like a teacher being observed by a print. And then, and then I say, well, I know exactly what you need to do. These five things will solve your problem. It's kind of silly, you know, and so it makes more sense to have the person be the one who's thinking through what happens, given that they know so much about what you're, you're experiencing. But at the same time, if they're stuck, it's really helpful to have someone who has expertise that they can share in a dialogical way. Right. Because I found the same, that, also where I've got leaders who are too afraid to share any input. So it's always, oh, that's a great inquiry. Let's inquire into that together. Right. And that can get frustrating as well. Like just give me something to try. Yeah, I would say the thing is you can't really talk people into a different way of being and a different way of approaching people. They have to experience it. So mm. for example, instead of going right to saying, well, here's what I think you should do. You could say to the teacher, um, you've probably thought a lot about this. What are you thinking you might do? And then they might say exactly what you're planning to tell them. And, and if they come up blank, then you can say, well, if it's all right with you, how about you share some things? You tell me which one do you think would work best? You know, that's, that's the way. So I think if, te if uh, whoever it is, coaches or administrators or whatever their role might be, if they take a coaching approach and they try to, as Michael Bungay Stanier says, ask more and tell less, be more curious, another one of his mantras, um, they might see that actually this works. It's more effective and the person owns the solution. If I tell the person, here's what you should do, then I own the solution. And then there's a real chance they'll come back and say, hey, I did that thing you said, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Because they don't own it, but if they own the solution, there's a better chance that they'll, they'll go the distance. One word I love that you use there in your modeling of a coaching conversation is might. I feel like you use the word might often. Right. And might to me offer offers like so many possibilities instead of shutting a conversation down. Well, I think uh, teaching is incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when they talk about complexity in science, they talk about parenting as a complex job. Well, if raising one child is complex, how complex is 30 or 40 or 25 or whatever you've got in your classroom? It's incredibly complex. And so to me, the only truly honest response to that complexity is humility to say, I don't know if this will work. I think if we work together, we'll get there, but here are some choices. What do you think? Do you want to try these things out to think that there's just a solution and we just do it this way. And the other thing is people always do things their own way. They never do it right. sort of by the book. Even people who use scripts will teach it differently. So, um, so I think the humble response is, is the authentic response is kind of how I put it. So you've kind of touched on this, but I'm wondering, how do you begin to form those partnership relationships? How do you shift that, the way that we interact in that mindset coming into those conversations? So you mean like an administrator? Yeah. How would they... Well, I think, um, I think every conversation holds the potential to be one where both people are thinking together instead of just one person doing their thinking. So you can always, I think, I think to become more coach like, it's a great book by John Campbell and Christian Van Neuerberg about leaders as coaches. I think that's a good place to start, but I think you, you, and also Michael Bungay Stanier's book, The Coaching Habit would be another really good starting point. So those two books uh, are great ones. There's lots of them, but those two really, I think if you're, if you're trying to take on a more coach coaching kind of approach, I think that's a good start. But I think, um, I think you, you, you need to think about which questions are the most effective. Qu I mean, the two things that make coaching really run are the way you ask questions and the way you listen. And those are skills, just like learning how to skate is a skill. Anybody can learn how to do it. If they have a mobile body, they can learn how to skate. And 
anybody can learn how to listen better and ask more, more effective questions. It's about developing a list of questions you work from and trying them out and see which ones work with you. And then same thing with listening, but the easiest way to accelerate your skills and both those things, questioning and listening, is to video record your conversations, go back and look at it and see what you see. Which is intimidating. That's it, We'll get to better conversations in a bit, but that's a big piece I took away from that book is taking that opportunity to record yourself and watch it. Why do you think it's so powerful for people to do that? Well, I think people don't have a clear picture of reality. They don't know what it looks like when they do what they do. And, uh, um, and so video cuts through that. And there's a whole bunch of reasons, perceptual errors, things like confirmation bias, habituation, um, any kind of self-serving bias. We tend to see the world in colored ways, first off, but then secondly, we have defense mechanisms wired into our system. It's not, everybody does it. Everybody minimizes the problem or blames some kind of external factor or, you know, so because of defense mechanisms and, um, perceptual errors we just don't see things really clearly and so video cuts through that video gives us a clear picture there's a reason why every you know every athlete over 12 watches themselves on video pretty much you know there's probably in the united states there's probably not a football team that doesn't watch themselves on video from middle school on up because video reveals reality for you and it helps you see progress and growth and until you look at video um you probably don't know what's happening. And the other thing about video is uh, the reason why it's difficult. Well, part of it is just, you know, uh, no one ever looks at it and says, I'm younger and thinner than I thought. Nobody ever likes that. But, <laughs> I look but the amazing. Other, <laughs> but the other thing is, I think, um, you know, we have these defense mechanisms to kind of protect our efficacy. And then and, and video is going to cut through that. And so we're going to see kind of in its rude reality what life really looks like. And sometimes that's hard to take. And then we tend to be really hard on ourselves when we look at it. So that that's a big amount. But if you want to get better, you have to know what it looks like now. It's pretty, if you don't have a clear picture of where you are and where reality is, you could spend a lot of time working on exactly the wrong things. So you need to get a clear picture of reality. And whether it's in, in coaching or whatever it is, you're, you're going to really accelerate your growth if you're, if you're getting a clear picture of what you're doing. So do you suggest if I'm a coach observing a lesson that I record the lesson I'm observing as well, or just the feedback conversation after? For you to improve or for, for the teacher everyone to, to improve? Yeah. Well, I think it's really helpful for teachers to be the ones who uh, interpret what's happening in the classroom. And so video provides a way for them to do that. Instead of you showing up with an observation form and saying, here's what you did right and here's what you did wrong, to have the teacher analyze their own class with, with the form and then sit down and talk to you after watching video. But at the same time, video is emotionally complex. Teaching is emotionally complex. And so I'm hesitant to say you have to do it. I think it's a choice. It's a power tool for learning. And if people don't want to do it, they, they shouldn't. But for us, you know, our catchphrase is video is like rocket fuel for learning. When you, uh -huh. when you see it, you're like, oh, that's got to change. You know, and you can use it in all kinds of ways. And then in terms of in terms of coaching, I mean, you would use video to look at what you want to improve. And so if you want to become a better listener, you would record yourself doing questions. If you want to get better explanations, you would record yourself doing that. Whatever, whatever thing you want to look at, that's what you would look – whatever thing you want to improve, that's what you would look at. I think this is clever because I don't know if you've ever – experienced this. But when I was an administrator, I thought I had the administrator's curse, which is whenever I walked into the classroom, things would just fall apart. You mm. know, the energy changes. So I could see video being a great tool for the teacher has ownership and agency over it. They choose when and how they record. They choose if they want to scrap that recording and try again. It might be a way to make that classroom observation way less intimidating. Right. I think... If the teacher agrees, it would be really helpful for you to be able to see the video too. Um, right. Because if you, and I've tried this, but if you try to coach someone and you didn't see, see the class and you didn't uh, see the video, it's not, uh, to me, the optimal situation is where I record the video and then we can both watch it afterwards when you watch it separately. Um, because watching the video is like, um, it's like watching a game on TV versus being at the game. There's a lot more going on than the video can ever capture, but still watching it on TV is better than nothing. And the same thing with this video is better than nothing. But I think to try to talk through what happened in a classroom without having observed it or without watching a video is very, I found it very hard to do. Mm, very good to know. 
I'm curious, Jim, about your impact cycle. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact cycle? Sure. All of these questions. So the impact cycle for us, it's a product of about 10 years of research. We kept, we used the process of re research called lean design research, where we, uh, it's kind of like the design cycle, sort of put together this book, the lean startup plus the design cycle. And we kept going through iterations, trying to improve what we were doing. And after a lot of continuous improvements, um, refinements, we landed on this sort of universal model for change. It's pretty straightforward. So the first part is called identify. And in the identify stage, we identify a clear picture of reality. Then we identify a goal. And then we identify a strategy to hit the goal. And the strategy is kind of like a pathway to our goal. It builds hope. And at the end of the identify stage, after we've looked at reality, we set a goal, we've identified a strategy, the teacher has a goal they deeply care about hitting, emotionally compelling goal, and they have something they're going to try to take them to the hole. Then the next stage is learn. And in the learning stage, we help the teacher get ready to implement the strategy. That often means we share a, a checklist, but the checklist is shared dialogically. We don't say this is the way it has to be. It becomes mm -hmm. a third point for conversation. So I said, let's go through this thing and see what we think. And if you want to do it this way, you want to change it. But this could be a starting point. And then we give the teacher a chance to see it somehow. Maybe I go in the classroom. Maybe we watch another teacher. Maybe we look at a video. Maybe we co-teach. Maybe we don't need to do that. But often it's if somebody's really keen to hit a goal and they're going to try a strategy, they're often going to say, you know, help me if I could see this, if I could see somebody doing it. And so at the end of the learning stage, you have a person who's ready to implement. And then the third stage is the improve stage. And in the improvement stage, what happens is um, first thing you try probably doesn't work. And so uh, you get all excited and you go through the checklist and you try it out and there's no change. You know, you change your questioning. Kids are just exactly as unresponsive as they were before. And so then you have to make adaptations. And so the improvement stage is making modifications. And there's only a few things you can do. You can change the strategy. You can change how you teach the strategy. You can change the goal. You can change how you measure progress towards the goal. Or you can just wait. But you're going to have to do some adaptations. And, you know, with complex situations, you need to have adaptive models anyway. So the adaptation, adaptations take place in the improve. And when, when you've made those adaptations, you should finally get to a place where um, – You've hit the goal, you know, mm -hmm. the, and uh, by making modifications, you get to the goal. But you, we've used it in education, but now it's been adopted. Uh, we did some studies with um, uh, Harvard on um, surgeons using the impact cycle, and now we've worked with the Royal College of Surgeons on um, positive health coaches using the impact cycle, and we feel it's a universal cycle. We say, you know, what's our goal? Let's get ready. Let's make changes until we hit the goal. That's kind of the process. How cool. Well, and how cool when you hit on something that's so resonant and transfers beyond your own discipline. Mm, yeah. And well, it's great to learn by stepping out of your discipline. So, yes. Okay. I've got to ask you a few more detailed questions about this cycle. So, All right. the, the first word you said that really resonated with me was this idea of emotionally compelling goals. Right. So, how do we help teachers to identify emotionally compelling goals? Well, the first thing is um, they get a clear picture of reality. If they don't have a clear picture of reality, there's a really good – because motivation, according to Miller and Rolnick in a thing called motivational interviewing, which is a great approach to therapy, they say motivation comes from a discrepancy between where I, where I am and where I want to be. So I would like to run the Boston Marathon. I'd like to qualify for the Boston Marathon. Right now, I couldn't do the Boston 5K, but I, I would like to do that. That's a goal I have. So I know where I am and I know where I need to get to and I know the changes that have to take place. And then if I can have a pathway to the goal, that's, that's going to help me. So first thing is that people have a clear picture of reality. The second thing is that, that we use powerful questions to help them identify the thing they want to work on the most. And you even ask the question, you know, if you could hit this goal, do you really care about it? Does it matter? And what you want is you want, you want the thing they think about when they drive home. So you ask questions like, so on a scale of one to 10, how close was that to an ideal class? And what would it take to move it closer to a 10? And do you want that to be a goal? And would you really care about that if that was your goal? Oh, well, then how would you measure it? And so you, they're the ones making all the decisions, but by having, you know, over time we revised our questions 
over that 10 years of research and we landed on this set. Now it's not that you ask them in sequence and it's different every time and you adapt to the situation, but there are powerful questions that put the ball in the other person's court and give them a chance to do the work. Which book is this in that has the, the set of questions? Well, it's in a few different ones in the impact cycle or in the definitive guide to instructional coaching, the, the humble title, the definitive guide to instructional coaching, but, um, <laughs> but it's probably best in that book. That's probably where okay. they're the, the most recent version. And also our website, instructionalcoaching.com, there's a blog. And if you poke around on the blog, you can find it there for free, for sure. And there's a, videos about the impact cycle and many of the things we talk about. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to be doing some goal setting with the school. And I've got a list of questions, but I think that intentionality piece is what I really want to focus on is what do you care about? What is, what is something that's going to wake you up every morning excited to teach? And so, so what, that time. what are your questions? Oh gosh, I don't have my document open. That's okay. <laughs> um, I think most of mine center on that concept of intentionality, though, of just like, right. what is it that you care about? What What are the things that would make you feel more confident as an educator? So I would say you want to ask the way we would do it, what we learned. See, I was just, just almost shifting into giving you advice. But um, <laughs> the first thing I'd say is you want to ask questions that uh, as we do it, we've discovered that give control over to the other person. And then we want to ask questions um, that are solution focused, not problem focused. Okay. And so a problem focused question is, um, you know, what's going to get in the way of you hitting this goal and a solution or what's not happening in your class? You know, what are you disappointed about? And a solution focused goal question would be, and this is kind of a famous, this is kind of a weird question, but I love this question. It's, um, so if a miracle happened and you woke up tomorrow and everything was going the way you want it to go with this class, what would it look like and what would be different? I like that. If you and can wave so a magic that, wand. <laughs> yeah, that was the same thing. And, yeah. and that question, it's a solution focused question and it puts, gives them a chance to describe what they want. And then they'll say, wow, there were, there's quite a few things that would be different you know, the kids would not be disruptive. And uh, I think the conversations in class, I'd find them energizing or whatever. And so, so the questions that give them control, questions that give them power, power, and then you shift from more open questions to more focused questions uh, where they can, you know, start to identify the strategy they're going to, like that question, you've probably thought a lot about this. What do you think you might do? That helps them identify the strategies without you having to say, here's what you should do. Awesome. I'm going to add the wave of magic wand. I think that's a really okay. cool warm up. All right. I'll let you know how it goes. So that takes you to the next. So I've set a goal. I set a goal that I really care about and that really fires me up. Right. And in the learn stage, you said you suggest strategies. And I'm curious, do you have a list of these strategies somewhere? Is there a way you organize different strategies? What does that look like? Um, well, we have a book called High Impact Instruction, but there are lots of good books. You know, I think I think Hattie's Visible Learning, uh, especially the new one, identifies something. Now, Hattie's work doesn't really tell you what the strategy should be, but it gives you sort of a, a framework for seeing things. Uh, Brian Goodwin's, uh, for comprehensive books, Brian Goodwin's book, um, Classroom Instru the, the New Classroom Instruction That Works, which is kind of a revision of Marzano's work. And uh, those kind of books give you a big picture, but then there are more specific things you might do. It could be Carol Tomlinson's work on differentiated instruction or any number of different things. Julie Stern's work on uh, really getting into what kids are supposed to learn and, and how they're going to learn. Uh, so there's lots of different ways in every play. It could be it could be you've got material on formative assessment or community building or classroom discussion or small group activities. So there's comprehensive books like my book and like the other books I mentioned, but then there's uh, other stuff that's out there. But we say you need to create a playbook, and your playbook identifies these are our 15 to 20 top strategies. When we work with teachers, mm. the most common goals seem to be here. And these seem to be our best bet for how to address those things. And so we cool. build this playbook over time. And the playbook has uh, a list of the strategies, maybe 15 to 20 strategies on one page. And then it has what we call one pagers. And the one pagers say, this is what the research says. And this is how it's used by teachers. This is how it's used by students. Here's summing up the thing in just a couple bullet points. This is, this is the heart of the matter. And you can read the one pager and go, okay, I like this or I don't like this. And then, and there's checklists. The checklists are not about, uh, 
being reductionist. The checklists are just to help it be clear when you explain things. And you say to the teacher, look, somebody wrote this checklist, but you may want to change it. So let's go through it and see what you want to do. And let's say the teacher says, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to butcher it. I'd like to do it in a way that nobody would think is going to work. Is that okay with you? Can we just, can we just like screw it up completely? And I would say, well, I wouldn't do it that way for these reasons, but you know your kids better than me. You know your teaching style. We have a goal. Let's see if it hits the goal. If it hits the goal, great. And if it doesn't, we'll come back and we'll make adjustments. So you don't have to be the fidelity police. You don't have to go in there and tell them what to do. You let them choose and you let the, the goal becomes, and a goal they care about, the goal becomes an objective standard of excellence. So that's kind of kind of how the whole process works. But I was riding on a plane. I ended up sitting beside this person who worked for Microsoft. And uh, we started talking about what she did. And um, uh, I said, well, how do you? And she said she goes and she helps people learn how to use software in different organizations. And I said, well, how do you know that they're going to do it when you leave? And she said, uh, well, we create playbooks. And then that day I went, oh, we should create instructional playbooks. And that's where that idea came from. It makes me think of two things. First is that I, th I would take a curious teacher making mistakes over a bored teacher following a checklist any day of the week. How about you? Well, I think, I think having the goal is the key thing. Right. And so I think the goal drives the process, whether, uh, you know, however it works, I, I would say once you have the goal that, that, as you said, intentionality, but then you're striving to hit the goal and, uh, and you stick with it until you get there. So whatever kind of approach they have when they start, they're probably gonna to move towards the goal if, if the process is working. Very cool. The other thought I had was that for leaders, this could be really cool homework to do is this time of year, we're talking strategic goal setting, right? Every school either has or is in the process of creating their strategic goals for the year. Why not spend time with your leadership team or you know a select group of teachers and make that playbook together and have your annual playbook connected to whatever your strategic goal is i just think that sounds like such a fun exercise and such a meaningful exercise yeah you might not like this but i'm not really fond of strategic goals um what? have you ever you ever been like off at a conference and everybody says let's go out to dinner tonight and then you all start talking about where you're going to go and then then you end up going for barbecue and then you're sitting there eating barbecue and then you say you know I know you all wanted barbecue, but I don't really like it that much. And then everybody goes, I can not like it either. And you realize nobody likes the food you're eating. You all just went along to get along. And to me, unless the teacher really cares about the goal, it's not going to happen. They're going to comply. They're going to do the bare minimum, but they're not going to be all in. And without a clear picture of reality and a coaching process, I'm not sure it's going to work. Now, I'm not, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have clarity and focus. And these are things we're, we're working on. But I think... Um, I think without a goal the person cares about, it becomes a waste of time. And two years later, they don't remember even what it was. And sometimes those documents get lost. And we have a lot of hoopla at the start, and then it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. So to me, you could have a focus around a few areas that we're really zoned in on. And then, and then if you have coaching or whomever it is that's working with them to help them do that, you could even do video. We have a thing called video peer coaching where people can coach each other. They watch each other's video, and they learn how to coach, and they coach each other. And if you have a a uh, set of uh, teaching practices. A school in Bangkok uh, is using Tom Sherrington's uh, walkthroughs, and that that uh, the walkthroughs are one page sum or two page summaries of books, not not teacher walkthroughs, uh, not walkthrough observations. But um, you know, if there's a collective understanding of the strategies, then you can make it work. I think it. I think that can work. But I'm I'm. I'm not optimistic about people hitting strategies they don't care about. If everybody cares, if a whole team cares about the goal and you're sure they care awesome. and they hit the goal, it's a it's an awesome and beautiful thing. But if if a few of them don't care about the goal, then they just show up and they put in time and it's like eating barbecue when you'd rather be eating Thai food. You know? So what I'm hearing is if you have a strategic goal, it needs to be broad enough to encompass those personal inquiries or there has to be choice for teachers to pursue something that they actually care about. You need that flexibility in that big picture planning. Maybe. I don't Maybe. know. <laughs> I, 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 or you'd say just no big term goals that just every teacher, like my only pushback would be the research on collective efficacy, like Hattie's work that when we're all working towards something greater than our individual goals, that that is the number one mover and shaker. But 
But that collective efficacy only exists if people have individual e efficacy. Collective yes. efficacy means collective efficacy means we as a team can accomplish this. We believe personal efficacy means I can succeed. Collective efficacy is as a group we are stronger. Together we can do more. Yes. So bringing people together and giving them a goal that somebody else has decided for them, I don't think that builds collective efficacy. If you have a goal, if you have a goal that people truly care about, not just because they've been told to, but because they had a process of looking at their practice and, and, and collectively they agree on it, then you have a chance for collective efficacy. But, but the coll but collective efficacy isn't, it's not, it means everybody, everybody collectively believes we can do it together. Right. That's the key. And, and so to have the barbecue, ex the, the barbecue experience doesn't give you collective efficacy. What gives you collective efficacy is when people have change experiences. And over time, what's happened in education, in my experience, is people have, have so many things where they just go through the motions because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be something we do, and then nothing comes of it. And then the next year, they're a little less enthusiastic. A year later, they're less enthusiastic. And pretty quickly, people say, you know, this too shall pass. So I think, I think however you get there, if you have a whole school where everybody says, you know, hitting this goal is really important. It's an emotionally compelling goal to me. And they hit the goal. That's collective efficacy. But if you have a whole bunch of people saying, what is this thing we have to do again? Oh yeah, I better put something up so the principal can see it. I don't think that's collective efficacy. Smart. Always coming back to that sense of intentionality, a compelling goal that moves us. Right. I love and it. I would say too, the goal should be a student-focused goal, not a teacher-focused goal. A teacher-focused goal is I want to change my questions. I want to do more small group activities. I want to, I want to do more non-linguistic representations or graphic organizers. I want, to, I want to start the first five minutes of my class in a really powerful way every day. I want to identify my success criteria. All those kinds of things, while good, I don't think they'll be sustained without a student-focused goal. So when somebody comes to me and says, I want to change my questions, I say to them, okay, well, if you change your questions, what will be different for the kids? And then I say, okay, well, why don't we make that the goal? Because if my, if my strategy is, if my, my goal is I want to change my questions, there's a really good chance I'll change them a few times. And then the easiest thing to do is just drift back to the way I used to teach. Right. But if I have an emotionally compelling student focus goal, I have to stick with it until I hit the goal or let the goal go. But the, the, the emotionally compelling student focus goal in, in our experience would lead to much more sustained implementation. So ironically, focusing on the student focus goal leads to deeper implementation of the strategies. I don't know if that's ironic, but anyway, <laughs> no, this is paradoxically so something much. like that. So I would move from wave your magic wand and then shape that into a student centered goal. So yeah, and probably the person will come to you and say, well, I really think I need to do this thing whatever it might be, more, you integrate right. more technology. But the question I always say is, okay, well, if you do that, what'll be different for the kids? Because maybe it's not gonna, and you know, and what's the point of doing something unless you know it's having a positive impact on kids? You wanna find out what difference it makes for kids. Oh my gosh, can you just like live on my shoulder and just be always <laughs> here? <laughs> okay, so we go from goal setting to finding our strategy. And then the next part is this kind of improve and adapt stage. Right. And I wonder, what are the best strategies you found for this regulation process? Well, the first thing is you probably need a set of questions to help you identify where, well, the first, the very first thing you need to do almost with every coaching conversation is to make sure you're on the same page and to say to somebody, um, you know, what's on your mind today, or, uh, given the time we've got today, what's the most important thing for us to talk about? Because if that person's thinking about just a really wonderful experience they had in their class with kids and it's really on their mind or uh, some kind of negative experience, they have to deal with that first or uh, they won't really fully focus. Once I was working with a teacher and she had a student in her class who ha was in a foster home and uh, elementary school and he was there Friday and he got moved to a different school on Monday and she never got to say goodbye. She was probably one of the top 10 most important adults in his life, maybe top five most important adults, but he was there Friday, gone Monday. So I said, so what's, Krista, what's on your mind? And then we talked about that student who we both knew pretty well. And then after about 10 minutes, we got going. So the first thing I'd say in the adaptive stage is let's, let's get on the same page. 
And then you just have questions like, you know, what are you learning? Have you hit the goal? What's surprising you? And then what are our next steps? That's kind of the process you go through. What's something we can do to move forward? And then I like to check and say, so on a scale of one to 10, what's your commitment level? How committed are you to the goal now? And they might say, well, I think I'm about a four now. I don't think I'm that committed. And then I say, well, what do we have to change to get back to a high level of commitment? Mm. You know? Always the intentionality. I think that's what's resonating through this conversation is that through each stage, you're coming back to, but what's your why? And why does it matter? Why does it matter? Right. Very cool. Is there a cadence that you find is most appropriate? Is this a weekly thing, a monthly thing, a semesterly thing? I think you have to meet every week if you can. Um, okay. Because maybe you can. If you can't, you can. But it, it, first off, let's say why every week. If you say, I'll get back to you in two or three weeks, then the teacher's like, well, I don't really have to. I mean, I'll check on it next week. But if you say, I'll be back next Tuesday, then there's a, you maintain a kind of urgency. A flow. And, um, and uh, so I say you shouldn't go two weekends without connecting. And... But yet, if you were to meet every day, I don't think there'd be time. And there's a study that I read at Harvard Business Review about, about this, that if you meet too frequently, there's not enough time for reflection. So you need time in between. You try things out. You think about it. But, but you keep the you know, foot on the pedal, so to speak. Keep moving forward. But if you can't meet, then you look for alternative ways of connecting. So whether it's something like WhatsApp or uh, the thing called Marco Polo, a free communication thing where you can do asynchronous uh, conversations, it's kind of like um, asynchronous coaching. They can send you a question or give you a comment and you send them back a video and you can see each other's faces. And Smart. that doesn't work. You can try texting or phone calls or Skype or Zoom or whatever it might be, Teams. But I think you want to keep, you want to keep urgency there without being so urgent they don't have time to think. So weekly touch is kind of the sweet spot. That's our thing, yeah, once or twice a week for sure. Love it. Okay, so we are improving, we're adapting, which takes us to the final place where we're kind of achieving the goal. Right. And so I've got to ask you the question I told you at the beginning I'm a real nerd about is data. Uh, what data is worth collecting? Oh, boy. Um, well, first off, are you gathering, the way we would look at it is are you gathering engagement data or, or achievement data? And some people would say all I care about is achievement, but engagement is the reason kids drop out of school. And uh, if, we want to, if we want to be equitable in our schools, we have to make sure we create places where people feel like they belong and that they have hope and they feel safe. And so I think, I think asking engagement goals. And so we break engagement down into behavioral engagement. Do they look like they're learning? Cognitive engagement is what's happening in their brain, what I had hoped would happen in their brain. And then, and then emotional engagement. Do they feel a connection with the school? Do they have hope? Do they have friends at school? And then there's all kinds of ways of measuring that. Those are various things. And then the second thing would be achievement. Well, with achievement, you probably need some kind of way of looking at levels of achievement. It could be Bloom, or Old Bloom, or New Bloom, or somebody else. But, you know, um, we talk about uh, procedural, excuse me, uh, content knowledge, procedural knowledge, and conceptual knowledge. That's a way of looking at Bloom's taxonomy, I think. So con content knowledge would be, I don't know, just you have to know the definitions of terms or something or the history of something. And, uh, and then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what kind, of, what kind of learning is happening here? Is this acquisition? Is it connection? Mm -hmm. Or is it transfer, which is work I've learned from Julie Stern. And then there's all kinds of methods of things you could do. It could be exit tickets. It could be bell work. It could be some kind of test. It could be you know, brief constructed responses. It could be a single point rubric. It could be a multi-point rubric, analytic rubric. And you pick the thing that's going to help you assess whatever it is. So if you say, well, I really want to, I really want to look at uh, conceptual knowledge and transfer, then you're probably either going to interview the kids or you're going to use rubrics of some sort. Beautiful. So, so you have to figure out. So, so in many ways, coaches need to be skilled. If instructional coaches, at least, need to be skilled in, in doing that. Now, if you're an administrator, you probably don't have time to go into all those details. And so you're probably going to do a more facilitative approach to coaching, like growth coaching which is in John and Christian's book. And there you're more about asking questions that help the person set a goal and help them make a plan. But that's going to be as far as it goes because uh, you probably don't have time for a lot of conversations. And you can still have a coaching conversation that gives them more control. 
what John and Christian say about their approach, which is not as uh, instruction heavy as instructional coaching. They say at the end of the coaching conversation, you should have uh, action, clarity, and energy. And that little acronym is ACE. So at, at the end of it, if you've really done a great job in the coaching conversation, which is mostly about not talking, um, the person should say, yeah, I know what I'm going to do. I feel good about this. And they've got yeah. that action, clarity, and energy. That's such a different way of looking at data. And I think if I could turn back time and go back to my classroom or go back to leading, I think it's the one thing that I would make the biggest change on is the mindset around data. Um, and the ownership of data, that, that teachers feel like owners of data as opposed to subjects of data. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, I think what, what I would say is, yes, absolutely. I mean, unless the teacher cares about the data, it's just like the goal, it's not going to matter. And so once they've set a goal, what's, what's going to show you that you're hitting the goal would be an important question, but it's helpful for the instructional coach to say, here are some options of what you could do. But I would say, uh, you know, we have created these list of rules, we call data rules, but one of the rules is, um, it has to be gathered frequently, like every week. Mm -hmm. And so if you say, my goal is that I want the reading scores to go up by 15% at the end of the year, but you don't gather data about it, that's a little bit like a GPS that just tells you if you've arrived. You need to know, because it's probably not working. The first things you do probably don't work, so you've got to make modifications. So, right. so if you say, I want my reading test scores to go up, then you have to figure out, well, how are we going to do frequent curriculum-based kind of assessments weekly to see if we're moving in on our way towards that score. And shouldn't be a surprise what the scores are when you get the test scores at the end of the year. You know, and even right. if it was a one-off weird score, you have the evidence to back, I'm not worried, the kids have made the progress. Right, right. Cool. So much of this work and so much of your cycle reminds me of Bandora's facets of agency. Have you done any reading like of his? The only part that I, I all I really know about uh, uh, Bandora is uh, uh, modeling as a way of learning ideas. Yeah. and. And so that's a little bit that I know. When I when we studied modeling, Bandura was who, who one of the people we looked at. And I read it mostly through a book called The Influencer by, uh, uh, I think, one of the authors, Patrick. So that's where I heard about it. So I don't know that, but that's tell me more about that. So you've identified the four different stages. So what you've said as emotionally um, compelling goals, he would call intentionality, that language okay. I'm calling forth. Then what you call the learn stage, he would call forethought, um, setting an intention of what okay. it would be like. Mm -hmm. And then his next stage is self-regulation and then self-reflection. So a lot of parallels hmm. there, which I just always think is so affirming when you see research that aligns, that right. deepens each other. Right. The cycle that we used, it just grew out of our work. So we worked right. with teachers and Beaverton, coaches in Beaverton, Oregon, and then in Othello, Washington. And we had about uh, a few years before we were there with uh, coaches in Topeka. And, and over time, it just kept evolving. And we would say, you know, it's really going to be helpful if we have a set of questions because it's not working what we're doing right now. So then we went out and interviewed people like Joellen Killian and uh, Bruce Wellman and Steve Barkley and Lucy West and Susan Scott, and we got all these questions. I went to Susan Scott's workshop, and then we frigged around with the questions for a while until we mm -hmm. sort of sorted out the ones that really work for us. And similarly, how we use video and the kind of goals we set, all those things grew out of the process of just trying it out and seeing if, we, if it worked or not. It's beautiful. Jim, I have to talk to you about Better Conversations because Great. that was a book for me. It's like, you know, you have your top 10 books on your Kindle. Like right. that's one of the books that's always in my top 10, because whenever I face conflict or feel just stuck in life, it's one that I come back to. And mm -hmm. it had so many ahas for just how I interact with the world. So first, thank you for writing such an amazing book. Hmm. Well, Where did that come from? I think that I'm not a really good communicator. Um, <laughs> uh, Elena, I think it was Elena Aguilar told me once that uh, you write the book you need to read. And uh, I think your mess is your message. <laughs> and so I think, and I'm still not really a great communicator. I mean, I really work hard at it. I think I can present fairly effectively, you know, and I can communicate complex ideas in accessible ways. But just in terms of, as Liz Meisman says, being a multiplier versus a diminisher, really listening carefully, compassion at the deepest level, you know, being a being an ally. You know, sometimes I'm a little too internal to realize I could connect at a deeper level, you know. So writing the book was a chance for me to think deeply about about it. And I, I um, as I was writing it, I thought, 
who am I to write a book about communication? I'm not a really good communicator. And so we went to see this singer songwriter, Andy Gullihorn. I've told this story many times, but um, he has a song called I will. It's about how to be a friend. Mm. And he says, whatever you need me to do, I will do it. He says, you need me to listen to you. He says, you need me to cry with you. He said, you need me to die with you. And life involves a lot of dying. He says, I will. That's the song. And uh, when he introduced it, he said, I wrote this song, not because this is who I am. I wrote this because this is who I want to be. Yeah. And uh, so then when I, the song was over, Jenny and I, and the concert was over, Jenny, my wife Jenny and I were in the car. And I said, that thing Gull Gullihorn said, it's not who I am, it's who I want to be. I said, I feel like I can write the book now. And she said, well, first you're right, you're not that good a communicator. But then she said... Um, <laughs> But maybe you're exactly the right person to write it because I think we're all struggling. We all feel we could get a little bit better. Yes. We all want to communicate more effectively. We all have hard, hard conversations as, uh, uh, as we have to experience. So, yeah, that's, that's how it came to be. It's an art. Having conversation is an art that I fear is dying. Um, but might I just kind of say some of the ahas that I had from the book? Yeah, I love it. To them a bit? Okay, I've got a few. Take all day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aha number one and is this concept of life bringing conversations mm -hmm. uh, and that being the barometer for if you're on the right track with connecting with others has right. just, I come back to that again and again. So tell our audience, what's a life bringing conversation? How do you know it? Well, yeah, we might use the term life giving too. Now it's, it's, we're, it's kind of evolved, but I would say, um, have you ever had a conversation that just sucked the life right out of you? It's the opposite of that. So it's a conversation that brings energy and efficacy and connection sometimes. And, uh, where you both feel it's a conversation where you say that was time well spent. It's not necessarily a happy conversation. You know, it could be about, uh, being an ally for somebody or, uh, just listening to them as they talk about what they're going through, but it's where you look at it when you go back and you go, well, that was, you know, I had this amount of time to live and I lived that little bit really well because that was a good thing to do. Beautiful. It, to me, it's like it aligns with your values. You can check every box of, you know, I value growth and this conversation met that. I value, value connection and this conversation mm -hmm. met that. Love it. And I think it's a cool success criteria for us as leaders that when I come away from the majority of my conversations, I want them to have been life bringing. Do you think that's a fair metric to hold myself to? I don't know about the number, but I would say I want to have more, you know, and I think my time is better spent in a, in a conversation where we both feel it's what Paula Flaherty would call a mutually humanizing conversation. So I think that's true. Beautiful. Okay. Aha. Number two, um, this idea of assumption in conversation, mm -hmm. um, this has been a slow realization for me. I come from a family of assumers, right? Mm -hmm. So like you did this, I know exactly why you did it. It's like, well, no, right. that wasn't my intention. No, I know what you really meant there. So right. talk to me about, um, assumptions. Where do they come from? How do we defeat them? Why are they so problematic? Well, a lot of people have written well about this. Susan Scott's book, uh, Fierce Conversations, really uh, does a good job of talking about how our stories can interfere with communication. Even, um, even the book, The Four Agreements, is about don't make assumptions because when you make assumptions, you, you cause a lot of problems. But um, I don't think they're helpful uh, because uh, they often are judgmental. And judgment is a learning killer. It's a... It's an, it's a it kills connection. You know, it's an intimacy killer. You know, right. you're not going to feel close to somebody that is rolling their eyes when you talk. And Michael Fullen says, there's a lot of way to roll your eyes that don't involve your eyes. So, um, so there's that, I think it, they can be judgmental, but it also doesn't help the conversation. There's a book called connect. And I think the authors are Bradford and Robin. I'm not hundred percent sure they're re researchers at Stanford, but they say in a conversation, let's say you and I are having a conflict. And in the conversation, and uh, you can tell me what you observed, you got your data, right? and you can tell me how it affected you. But if you tell me why I did it, then it becomes a problem. And so an effective conversation is about, here's what I saw, and here's how it's affecting me. Not about 
why you did it. The moment you talk about why I did it, then the conversation becomes an argument about whether or not my interpretation of you is right. And the way they put it is it's like a tennis court. When you play tennis, you have to stay on your side of the net. And when you start to talk about why the person did something or what, what your story is about them or their assumptions, they say you're crossing the net. You have to stay on your side of the net. And your side is, here's the data and here's how I experience it. If our listeners take away anything from today, if this concept doesn't resonate with you yet, this concept of assumption, I think it is worth exploring more because it's a transformative one. Would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, I think there's well, there's a lot of good ideas, but I really like Susan Scott's Fierce Conversations. It's a, a great explanation. If I had to pick one book, I'd, that would be one I'd probably look at. Beautiful. Okay, another one for me is I realized in your book that I had a problem with gossip. Uh, why does it feel so good to gossip, Jim? Why does it feel so good? Hmm. <laughs> well, there's a lot of bad things that feel good. You know, I think, uh, yeah. why does food have to taste it? Why couldn't healthy food taste great and unhealthy food taste crappy? But nonetheless, you know, ice cream tastes pretty good. So um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, but I would say, here's something about that. I think um, we, we make a mistake if we say we are one kind of person. Like I'm a person who, who likes gossip. What matters isn't what you've done in the past. And it doesn't matter conversations you've had where it feels good. What matters is this conversation right now, this interaction right now. All that matters is this interaction. And maybe yesterday I was a gossip and maybe tomorrow I'm going to be a gossip. But right now, when I'm talking to this person about their mom and their worries about their mom, I can be present without, without and listen and do all the things at work. And, and then the more often we can have good moments, uh, the better conversations we'll have, the better life we'll have, but right. it's not, we're not one thing or, and, and also I think people tend to define us. Oh, you're this, you're not really a good listener, but yeah, there's been times when I've really listened to been times when I haven't, what matters is I just try to have more, I try to get better. Mm -hmm. And if I screw up, tomorrow's another day, you know? So I, I don't think we're one thing. Human beings are very complex. They're not good or bad or this or that. We'd like to have simple little explanations of who the person is. But the truth is, yesterday they were a jerk. Today they're my best friend. It's really, it's really complex how people are. And I think we need to extend grace and mercy towards people, recognizing in most cases people are trying to do their best. And their best might not be what we want, but it's, that's all they've got right now, you know? So I think, mm. so I think whether it's gossip or how we listen or whether we judge other people, you know, I think, and you know, you can say, you can judge the Kardashians. I'm just not going to judge you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Cause judgment feels good too. I have no idea why it feels good to feel, maybe it puts us up, puts them down, but it well, feels it's, good. It's just not, it's not good for relationships. It's a quick connection. It's like starting a fire with just like, you know, things that burn fast and hot, but then there's nothing left. You know, right. there's not that deep, rich ember. Well, they're going to know you, they can't trust you. Exactly. What I did, so I was teaching grade five at the time, mm -hmm. and I let my students know I was reading your book, and I told them that one of my goals was to have more genuine and honest connections with people without gossip. So on the big board in my classroom, I wrote the two questions. Is it helpful? Is it kind? Mm. And I found the most often I came back to that was when my learning assistant and I were alone in the classroom and I'd feel myself starting to, you know, ramp up, oh, this principal did. And then I would look mm -hmm. at the board. Was it help? Is this helpful? Is this kind? And it was transformative and it's, it's changed me. That's like, I feel like that's a message that's always kind of in the board of my brain, you know? All right. Well, we would say you shouldn't judge others, but you also shouldn't judge yourself. You know, extend mm -hmm. grace to the same kind of grace to yourself that you extend to others. Kristen Neff writes about self-compassion, says you have to treat yourself with the same compassion you'd extend to a friend. Treat yourself like someone you like. You know, that's the, the idea. Love it. Okay. Um, another aha is my favorite quote from the book, which is, will what I say open up or close down the conversation? So hmm. can you speak to that quote a little bit? Well, I think um, it's like, is this, con is this question going to... Uh, move towards a more humanizing conversation or is it going to, uh, or is it going to make the person feel unsafe or I feel like you're, especially in coaching, you're trying to establish alignment with the other person. 
So part of coaching, that means they've got a goal and now I'm trying to help them get the goal. But, um, but I think a, a, a conversation that's judgmental or it's pretty easy to make people feel small. And there's other questions that can make people feel safe. Like that one that's Michael Bungay Stanier's question. You've probably thought a lot about this. What do you think you might do? The beauty of that question is it assumes you've got something valuable to say. It starts with a positive presupposition. And then, in, and then, and then you'll just hear the person ask questions. Whereas if I said, um, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. What do you, or, or, like, why haven't you, you know, why didn't you, why did you take so long uh, on the warm up activity? It was 22 minutes. Why'd you take so long? Well, that's a question that carries with a judgment. And that's right. like, you, you might respond, but you don't really feel great about it. Beautiful. I just have to plug for you that <laughs> this is the coolest book, the support resources for your website, uh, the thinking organizers you provide, even the cool, like, flow charts at the end of each chapter that are that summarize the thinking it is just elegant and eloquent and helpful so mm. everybody better conversations it should be on your list of books to buy and there's a free video of it on the website instructionalcoaching.com so they don't have to buy the book they can and they can download all the forms so there's lots of ways to access it amazing okay i've got two final questions i'm playing around with my final questions um so these are meant to be a little bit fun um you ready for those final two Yeah, questions? fun is good. Okay, I need more fun in my life, so bring it. That sounds good. <laughs> On this Thursday afternoon. Okay, um, what, Jim, was the biggest aha moment of your career? <laughs> is that all? Um, I think when I started out, I thought it was, we'll go with this one today. I think when I started, I thought it was my job to tell people what to do. And it was my job to be really clear and uh, explain things thorough and do these long, boring workshops where I explain what the research says and every little detail about what you have to do. And then I realized people weren't doing it and that, um, and that putting myself up here and putting them down here wasn't healthy. And then if I could see the other person not as an object to put stuff into their heads, but as a, as a partner that we could learn more and we could do more together and it feels better. So I think shifting from professional development as uh, an expert telling uh, an apprentice what to do to two equals sharing ideas, I think that was the big change. Beautiful. I see that mirrored in all of your work. Hmm. So that's a very cool through line of what you do. Okay. The last one's the funnest one. Before I ask it, can I see your best superhero pose? <laughs> no, carry on. <laughs> I have choice here and my choice is no. <laughs> okay, fine. Right. Um, what would you say is your superpower? Oh gosh. I don't know. Learning. I think I'm, um, I think learning, uh, Peter Senge says it's the generative, you, you're in alignment or something to the effect of you're in alignment with the generative process of life, just like trees grow, we learn. Mm -hmm. And so I think learning is off the top of my head. I'd say learning is the thing that, uh, which is a good thing because I have a lot to learn, you know? So I think, uh, I think if, if I, when I encounter, when I make mistakes or encounter defeats or things don't go the way I hoped they would go, I feel, well, there's still hope because I'm a learner and I can learn and there's probably a better way to do this and I can move forward, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. It might be a conversation that failed or presentation didn't go the way I wanted or a book that didn't go the way I wanted it. You know, there's always room for better. You know? That's the ultimate expression of agency to me. Like I have, both the self-efficacy and I know that I have the skill set. I've got the capacity to learn and make a change in my life. So that's really, really beautiful. All right, my friend, I learned a lot today. I came in with a lot of questions and I just am coming away with even more and so excited. And it feels like an incredible honor to get this hour with you. Well, thanks so much. I, I, I don't know. I want to save up all these kind things you said and send it to all my <laughs> friends. So. Well, thank you so much. Listen to him on a rainy day. <laughs> right. That's right. Thanks so much, Jim. Thanks. Take care. 
Okay, just stop the recording. Did that feel okay for you? Yeah, it's great. Thank you so much for all your kind things you said. It was very nice. Oh, it was so fun. I was um, I was a bit nervous to interview. I'm not going to lie. So mm. it was, I really, really appreciate it. <laughs>